Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniela Ligero, Vice President for Girls and Women's Strategy at the UN Foundation. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, you know, 50 years ago, Simone de Beauvoir, the famous French feminist, said, it's a man's world, and none of the explanations for why this is so seem adequate. And today, it's still a man's world. We've made a lot of progress, as you've heard, but today, not a single country in the world has achieved gender equality, and girls and women remain the majority of the world's poor, unhealthy, unfed, uneducated, unpaid, underpaid, underrepresented, and violated. And today, like 50 years ago, the explanations for why that is so do not seem adequate. As Kathy mentioned, it's time to change, and we have the prerogative. The question now is, how do we do that, and what's standing in our way? And our next panel is going to help us answer those questions. So it is my pleasure to introduce Alice Albright, Chief Executive Officer, Global Partnership for Education Secretariat. Come up, Alice. Ambassador Deborah Burks, U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and U.S. Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. Lisa Kassinar, Editor-at-Large, Global Women's Coverage, Bloomberg News. And Ritu Sharma, Co-Founder and Former President of Women Thrive Worldwide and Board Member of the Fuller Project for International Reporting. Welcome so much. Hello? Hello. Oh, that works. Wonderful. Oh, what a pleasure to be with this star-studded panel. Thank you for being here today. Um, Ambassador Burks, let's start with you. Um, why is focusing on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of girls and women so important to achieve the SDGs? Well, we knew it was important from the beginning because when we look at economic development, it often relates to fertility rates and choice. But it became very important to us after President Obama and Secretary Kerry and launched DREAMS, Determined, Resilient, Empowered, AIDS-Free, Mentored, and Safe Young Women, where it was clear that what young women wanted, every place we, want, we went, was to prevent pregnancy. So when we would talk to them about their risk factors and how one in three had HIV and their risk for HIV, they were like, yeah, yeah, no one can see I have HIV. They can see I'm pregnant and I can't access any reproductive health materials. I don't know what the options are, and if I go to the clinic, people turn me into the aunties or to the community. And so they are completely unable to access. So we believe at least eight of the sustainable development goals really related to having that choice, and we're very much focused on not only giving that choice, and having that commodity mix available, but ensuring that in the school system, young girls are taught what their sexual and reproductive health is and their rights are. And that's not only taught to girls, but as it was discussed from Uganda, taught to the boys too. So they grow up respecting that women need to have that choice at every age from 10 up to 24, which is part of the DREAMS project. So we're very much focused on this, not only um, for HIV positive women, but for young girls and all women in resource limited settings. It's amazing. Um, Lisa, let's turn to you now. Tell us a little bit about the work you're doing in mostly a male dominated field to really make sure that the voices of women are heard and what some of the challenges are and how you're overcoming them. Well, um, about five years ago, Bloomberg News started a project that was where I was a team of one, um, and that was by, by design. Uh, I worked very closely with Matt Winkler, who was the founding editor of Bloomberg News, to take Bloomberg, which writes about 5,000 stories a day in 150 bureaus in 72 countries and has a hugely male audience of people moving the world's money around. Uh, what we wanted to do is redefine Bloomberg News to show that women were equal economic actors in whatever capacity. They're half the people, they're half the people out there. Let's reflect for the world's investing community that they are part of whatever the global economic business and finance story is. Um, 
And the, the team of one aspect was important and ended up being incredibly interesting because we didn't want to assign a group of reporters to cover the women's stuff. I just did not want every press release in a, with a woman in it sent to Lisa's team. So we, I was able to kind of um, push things back to uh, our reporters around the world and it really generated an incredible, um, you know, not only did we produce thousands of stories about the role of women in the global economy in the last few years at Bloomberg, but we have also, uh, I think, spurred incredible passion and goodwill around this issue among men and women. Um, and the other thing is that it spurred a lot of uh, internal change that was a little bit unexpected, um, including, I mean, it, it became deliberate, but when we started, we didn't know that this was one, gonna be one of the outcomes, which was that we um, had to decide who the news decision makers are. And once you start to look at that in a big news organization, you realize, you know, that that was out of kilter also. Um, and the number of women team leaders in the Americas was tripled. Um, that's news team leaders overseeing news judgment. Uh, the number of people organizing and, and choosing news for our top page uh, became much more balanced, much more diverse. Um, so there was all this kind of ancillary benefit from just saying like, what if we covered women differently? Um, another thing that happened is that we really changed, the, it. it it drove people to change their language around women as well, just by paying attention to it. Great, so a little bit of the story of what's happening within the world of media and news and how important it is to tell that story about women and girls and how we engage. Ritu, can you say a little bit about why it's important to engage the grassroots and advocates? We heard earlier from some of the young women in this process and as part of SDG implementation. Yeah, absolutely, and happy International Women's Day. I think my philosophy is this, it's very simple, and that is that we should put our mouths where the money is. That is what's going to get the SDGs really implemented. And we have to continue to be very strong advocates, but not advocates for women and girls, but we need to be the ones who are helping build the capacity of women and girls around the world, like the young women that we heard from, to do the advocacy with their communities, with their national governments, with their local governments, to see that the SDGs are really implemented. You know, I think as women in the North, I'll say, though that the role we have to play is certainly to push our own government, and our government certainly needs pushing. But we shouldn't speak on behalf of or instead of women in, in the global south. I think that the best thing that we can do is really fund, support, build their capacity, um, and build their passion. I have to say that one of the funnest things that I ever have done is to take women from developing countries up to Capitol Hill and give them the podium, give, give them the, the dais for testimony, and just see them light up with the ability to tell their own story to some of the most powerful decision makers uh, in Washington. Those are some of the best moments um, of my life. So I think that that's really our role in seeing the SDGs implemented. That's great. And Alice, you know, it's interesting as we think about voice and the ability to tell, tell one's story, I can't help to think about the importance of education. We also heard about that in the panel earlier. So much progress has been made when it comes to putting girls in school, especially in primary education, over the course of the MDGs. What are some of the things that we know really work to get more girls in school? And what are the opportunities now with the SDGs to really push this agenda? Lots of good questions, and thanks again for including me, and it's wonderful to be with so many friends. Um, I'd say about progress, yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the number of children that are in primary school has increased dramatically uh, since 2000, and I think that is one of the important achievements that have been made from the MDGs to now. But there are some very important things that are missing. Um, one of them is that children aren't learning hardly anything, uh, no matter what level you look at. The other thing is that there is a huge drop-off between attendance at primary school and the grades above primary school. Some people call it lower secondary, some people call it upper secondary. But if you're using sort of a US equivalent, 
there's a huge drop off between elementary school and middle school and middle school and high school. Uh, so ask Malala about that question. Uh, you know, she was, um, is, you know, passionately interested and upset about the fact that there is very little good high school for girls out there. Um, there is also a huge learning crisis, depending on what level of school you're looking at. Children are not even learning the basics. But it being International Women's Day, let's talk about the problem for girls. What you do see is progress at, at what we call gender parity at primary school, but then girls get disproportionately out, left out of school, and I'll talk about why in a minute, uh, when you get above primary school. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, there are social reasons, uh, there are poverty reasons, there are infrastructure reasons, there are finance reasons, and there are what we call conflict reasons, and just a little bit on each one of those. Social reasons, which is part to do with poverty, is that when girls get to be of a certain age, families choose to marry them off rather than having them continue school, and that's where you see a lot of the early marriage rates. Uh, there are poverty reasons. Families are often uh, forced to choose between sending a girl to school and sending a boy to school. They will send the boy. Uh, when girls get to be of a certain age, they do not want to share bathrooms with boys. But a lot of the schools only have one set of bathrooms. Uh, and then there are societal pressures not to send girls to school. So the picture that you see at primary school is, on the one hand, okay, but it is by no means good enough. And when you look at the attendance and the success, the continuity of girls above primary school, it is a big problem. And that's one thing that if we're, go if we're gonna succeed with the SDGs, period, we have to fix this problem. You just talked about uh, sex education for girls. Well, that means they have to be in school and learning something when they're in school. Financing is a huge problem. Education systems around the world, particularly in the developing countries, are not financed adequately, and there's all kinds of numbers that we can point to about that. And then the other things, the last thing I'll say, is that education systems are increasingly vulnerable to conflict, crisis, man-made disasters, wars and civil wars, also natural disasters. 85% uh, of the world's refugees, for example, live in the 61 poorest countries, all of which are GPE countries. Uh, and so th the circumstances of conflict, crisis, fragility, which is about half of our business now, disproportionately also impact girls. So if we are going to achieve the SDGs, we have to get serious about education. And if we're going to get serious about education, we have to get serious about educating girls all the way to tertiary school, not just primary school, and having them learn something. Great point. Yeah. And I'm especially glad you brought up this idea of fragility in humanitarian settings and how we think about development in a much bigger sense across settings and geographies is really important, I think, to implementing the SDGs. That's great. So at this point, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to target any of you. You, you. I'll let you volunteer. We'd like to hear from you, like we did from the last panel. What are, and you've already touched on some of this, but what are the key things that we need to be doing and focusing on to make the SDGs a success. We have an audience here of folks from around Washington and the world who in their own lives have the ability to make a difference. What are the kinds of things we should be really focusing on? And so in a few words from each of you, would be great. Um, I'll, I'll start. I think that there are huge gaps in how we all talk about these issues. I think that um, I'm in a world where there are a lot of extremely powerful people. They are hugely male, and they have daughters, and they talk about that in all kinds of squishy ways, but they don't really engage with the notion that this is also going on, that we need to all sort of be pulling on the same oar here in terms of making these changes and accomplishing goals as a global community. Um, I encourage, and I I do this a lot and I will encourage the people in the room here, you know, you have to engage with the press. We have this conversation all the time where we don't get enough diverse voices. Uh, we don't have enough women who want to speak to the press or whatever it may be. Um, and we need to constantly encourage people who are in positions of power to engage with the global conversation and to um, participate in getting the word out there that this is something that we're we're kind of all in together. So that's, that's my communication that's message. Yeah. 
I think, you know, when you start to look at the depth of the issue, as you just highlighted, and we know how important education is as a feeder for all of these other elements that are important for girls' lives, when you start looking at the five or six barriers, sometimes people walk away to say that's too complicated and do something that is maybe scholarships for the already top 1% girls or the 2% girls to make the better already best. And so when you're trying to actually bring all the girls up, no matter where they come and reaching them where they are, that becomes, I mean, that's what we're having to do in dreams because you, in order to change HIV incidents, you have to have something for 10, 11, and 12 year olds, 13, 14, 15 year olds, 16, 17, 18 year olds, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 year olds, and have that bridge all the way to stability. And I think what, if I could say only one thing, it would be we have to demand that others come to the table with us and with the governments, whether it's Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance to make the business case, Ministry of Health, and demand these integrated, impactful programs that we believe will be impactful and then have the measurement around it to show that they are. And that means data down to the site level where that child lives to show the impact that those changes can have on that community and that girl's life. I would, let me just add on that a little bit. I think what I would say, you know, this 2016, 2015, 2016 is a very special set of years, particularly because of the SDGs as well as political transitions happening around the globe in a number of, of places. What I would say is don't chicken out of difficult decisions. Um, you know, it, you, one can easily see the SDGs falling off the radar. Uh, so what we need to do as this community and others that care about this is don't chicken out of the difficult decisions. A number of people in my area say, oh, education's difficult. Oh, you can't see the results for a long time. Oh, it's complicated. Oh, it's messing. Yeah, it is. Don't chicken out. And an interesting statistic uh, that I often think about is it would take, if you were to fund all of the education needs that are unfunded right now, it equals six and a half days of military spending globally. Think about that. Uh, it's a very interesting trade-off. If we were to just take one of those days of six and a half military, uh, days of military spending and spend it on education, we might cure some of the problems that are causing us to go to war. So, Given these SDGs that we've just signed up to, let's not chicken out of making those types of difficult decisions. I, I so like you. <laughs> You're so awesome. So I would say uh, two things, and both have to do with, with men. Um, one, men are awesome, let me just say that. Uh, you know, the thing about guys is that they're everywhere and they are in all of these positions. And the one thing is I do think that we need to hold them accountable. And the question that you asked, Daniela, at the beginning of the statement, like this is scandalous, some of these things happening. And we need to start treating them as such and blowing the whistle and having investigative reporting. And you know, how can these things still be, still be going on? And I think as women, we can be a little too polite that way. The second thing though is that I think our women's movement has missed a lot of opportunities to really bring men in, in a warm and welcoming way and have them become part of our movement. You know, hats off to the guys that are brave enough to be in the room or required to be in the room, whichever one it might be. Um, cheers to you. Um, but really we ought to have, you know, we always say this, we ought to have half half the audience being women, half the panel being men, et cetera. And I, I would love to see us being uh, more welcoming and have them join together with us because then it's going to be 90% of the people in the world against the 10% who are dragging their feet and don't want to change. Wonderful. Well, on that note, I'm going to thank all of you for being with us here today. What an amazing panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.